So welcome everyone and good evening. My name is John Mogul and I'm Associate Director at the Wilsonian FIU and we are very pleased to be presenting this student showcase um, in partnership uh, with the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab. Uh, the Wilsonian is, or the Wilsonian's collection is first and foremost a resource for learning. Um, and this evening's program um, is an opportunity that we rarely get, um, a look at the creative and intellectual work that FIU graduate students are doing using our collection. Um, as I said, we're presenting it jointly with the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab. And I'm gonna turn things over immediately uh, to Professor Nathaniel Cadel, um, a faculty fellow with the Public Humanities Lab and also an associate professor in FIU's Department of English. Um, and he has been teaching a graduate course called Material Modernism in this, the current semester. And that's the basis for this evening's presentation. So Nathaniel, it's your turn. Thank you, John. And thanks very much to the Wolfsonian for hosting us. Uh, as John said, I'm an associate professor in English and a current faculty fellow with the Public Humanities Lab. One of the long-term goals of the WPHL is to develop curriculum that centers on communicating humanities scholarship to the wider public particularly scholarship that involves research at the Wolfsonian and FIU's other museums and research institutions. Tonight's showcase is the result of such curriculum development. The five projects you'll be seeing tonight were developed, researched, executed, and are being presented by FIU graduate students enrolled in a master's level course I taught this spring, focused on the relationship between modernist literature and its print and material culture. For their final projects, students needed to meet only two requirements. One, to build collaborative research projects around material held in the Wolfsonian's library, and two, to address those projects to a general audience. Tonight, you'll see two videos that will be available on YouTube, two blogs inspired by the one run by Wolfsonian librarian Frank Luca, and a virtual museum gallery space, all dealing in some way or another with books, magazines, pamphlets, and posters produced in Europe or North America in the first half of the 20th century. At the end of the presentations, we will be providing links to these projects, and we invite you to revisit them at your own pace. The first team of students are Robert Greider, Natalie Sadakovsky, and Taryn Weinberg. Together, they've created and written a blog exploring the covers, advertisements, and contents of three notable pulp magazines, Black Mask, Amazing Stories, and Argosy. Instead of focusing only on the salacious covers, as a lot of people tend to, they argue that the manufacturing processes and contents of pulps parallel and sometimes intersect with the high art and literature of modernism. So please, Robert, Natalie, and Taryn, take over. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm just going to share my screen. OK, so here's our blog, Popularity. Um, as the professor just uh, gave you a little bit of an insight into what it's about, but I'll just recap. So we explore the connections between the pulp magazines, some of which you can see pictured here, um, their materiality and the modernist movement. Um, so traditionally and throughout a large part of the 20th century, uh, modernism was considered to be high art and the pulps were considered to be low art or low brow. Um, so our, our blog explains um, a different attitude towards that. Um, so we discuss how the pulp magazines show an unacknowledged history of modernism. And we also show how the magazines themselves through their art and their literature show demonstrate some of the same traits as the traditional modernists. Um, this is our home page of the blog. And like a typical blog, it's organized in such a way that the most recent posts appear at the top. So I'll also show you um, some other aspects of the site uh, before we go into some of the blogs. Um, on our about page, we give a little bit of context as to what we're about just for the casual user to understand um, what the blog is all about a little bit of context as to how it came about and also how our artifacts come from the Wolfsonian. 
And we also have a contact page in case anyone wants to provide any feedback. And we have another way that um, the community can interact with our blog, but my colleague will speak about in that in just a moment. Um, so my blog's specifically focused on the hard-boiled magazine called Black Mask. My first blog was called Black Mask and the Oxymoron of Pulp Modernism. So again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about how um, pulps were considered low art and modernism was considered high art. So it sounds like an oxymoron. But in fact, I argue that Black Mask was a modernist product. And in my second blog, entitled How Capitalism and Creativity Converged in Black Mask, I discuss how capitalism was thought of by the modernists as a, um, a force that worked against creativity. I, they were all about the avant-garde and the cutting edge. But in my discussion of Black Mask, I show that because these magazines were so determined to keep readers hooked, they were in fact pushing boundaries within their genre and um, being very innovative. So now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Robert, to discuss some aspects of um, his work on this blog. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us. And thanks to the Wolfsonian at FIU uh, for all their invaluable assistance. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, we've structured this presentation to sort of invite you in to the website uh, to explore, as Nate said, at your own pace. But I do want to bring your attention to, uh, if you're suffering from uh, a case of uh, infotension, uh, I would point your attention to the very last blog that I wrote. Now, if you could scroll to that one. Um, a lot of scholarship uh, has pointed to the fact of, the fact that pulp magazines and pulp fiction was cheap, that the paper was cheap, that the magazine was cheap, that it was meant to be disposed of. It was not meant to last. Uh, I think that's uh, that goes without saying. You can read all about uh, the manufacturing process in this website, but I think a point that is somewhat less discussed is the consequences uh, in terms of cultural transmission. I argue, the main point that I argue and that I would invite everyone to consider uh, as they read the first blog post is that there are consequences uh, to this sort of planned disposability of pulp magazines because it acts as a form of cultural erasure. Uh, meaning that uh, in terms of history uh, and in terms of culture, uh, it is oftentimes written and transmitted uh, by the winners. In this case, uh, those were not the pulp magazines. So we're experiencing a loss and we're experiencing a forgetfulness of pulp magazines due to their materi materiality. Uh, so I would invite you uh, at your leisure to uh, read particularly this blog post in which I narrate actually ordering uh, and, and claiming a physical copy of the Argosy magazine uh, and I went through it. Uh, so the funny thing is that I thought I would be able to read it, but I couldn't because as I tried to turn the pages, it started to fall apart. Um, so uh, that is what I invite the audience to, to, to really think about as we move forward. All right, and I'll turn it over to Taryn to go ahead and wrap it all up. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, and thank you Natalie. Um, so to just follow up my colleague's discussion of our presentation here of our blog, um, my blog posts, as you can see, are up on the screen right now. So this one right here is Modernist Art and its Influence on Pulp's like, Amazing Stories. So like Natalie was touching on how high art um, was kind of considered different, a different avenue than, than the pulps, which were um, at the time considered kind of trashy. Um, you can see that 
in this post, if you view it later, you'll see how some of modernist art and a different uh, avenue of art like pop culture of the 1960s um, was influenced by this time period of experimentation by artists uh, who were featured in pulp magazines like Amazing Stories. So you'll see some of that discussion here and you can actually view the entire issue of Amazing Stories that's discussed in that post. Uh, to also kind of touch on what Robert was saying about the preservation on um, the lack of pre preservation of this material. Uh, another blog post of mine, if Natalie just scrolls down a little further, is titled Amazing Stories and the Rise of Science Fiction Fandom. In uh, 1926, the uh, founder Hugo Gernsback of Amazing Stories actually termed science fiction for its first time. Um, he called it science fiction, took out the C of it. You know, now it's simplified down to sci-fi, but Amazing Stories was the very first kind of pulp magazine that ever focused on science fiction. And to have these uh, pulp magazines preserved uh, in a better condition than what Robert has described of the Argosy um, would have been better for the development and the preservation of the science fiction uh, fandom community. So you can see some of the uh, covers here that have been preserved to the best of the ability of uh, you know our Wolfsonian Digital Archive and some of the other sources uh, that we were able to find some of these digital uh, pulps at. Um, but it is important to kind of take a look at some of the material that was prevalent during the time. So you can see here where we discuss some of the advertisements that were featured at the time. Um, and there's an interesting conversation that happens about Black Mask and um, the Amazing Stories advertisements and kind of the cultural uh, elements of that time period, right? So if you want to take a look at some more of the covers and actual content of Amazing Stories and Argosy, because you can't actually, you know, get a lot of these copies on hand, you can take a look at Argosy's page or the Amazing Stories page that we have up top here. Secondary. And if you click on those, you'll be able to, um, and you'll see, that, you know, my art and that pop art that is, um, you know, influenced in here. So we also have a Twitter feed where you can keep in contact with us over at our link here. You can get to us on Twitter as well, but we have a full feed of our posts here. They just are kind of, you know, some fun facts and a little bit more of an interaction with the content of our blog posts. So we hope that you come and check us out. Um, like our professor said, we will be sharing the link to this presentation and the other presentations uh, at the end of all presentations. So I really appreciate you guys uh, taking a chance to get a preview of our project and hopefully take a chance to, to check us out later at popularity.weebly.com. Thank you. Thank you, Taryn, Natalie, Robert. Next up are Yates Diaz, Melissa Texador, and Kenneth Ward. The three of them have created a, vi a video that explores the visual rhetoric and various propaganda items circulated by both sides during the Spanish Civil War. As you'll see toward the end of their video, these ephemeral items provide important context for understanding the stakes of that conflict in the writings of George Orwell, Ernest Hemingway, and Federico Garcia Lorca. Yates, Kenneth, Melissa, take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Uh, my name is Kenneth. Um, I'm going to be introducing our group. Um, so for our project, the idea that we had was to explore the material conditions of the Spanish Civil War. Um, oh, I thought my video wasn't on. Anyway, uh, here I am. So um, we so by 
to do that, we decided that we would uh, explore the propaganda circulated by the various factions within the Spanish Civil War. Uh, for people who don't know, the Spanish Civil War had multiple factions. Um, it was not just the government versus whomever. It was, uh, there were fascist elements, there were communist elements, anarchist elements. We decided to, that we would just explore all of the propaganda, the historical timelines, and we also decided that we would explore the differences uh, between the styles, uh, not only subject matter wise, but visually, um, and explore the ways that the, uh, that the artists, whoever created the work, were trying to express their, uh, their rhetorical points through their artwork. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that's about that for an intro. And uh, we're, we're gonna show you this video now, Oscar. Nineteen thirties Europe was mired in political upheaval, fascism's meteoric rise prefaced the Second World War. In Spain, the democratically elected government held off a failed coup by the fascist Nationalist Party. This is the setting for the Spanish Civil War. Amidst this backdrop, propaganda reinforced the ideological characteristics inherent to each faction. Propaganda's ephemeral nature, while urgent and necessary, now exists as a relic of this struggle. El Socorro Rojo Internacional, or the SRI, was a humanitarian organization headed by the Communist International. Their efforts, while humanitarian on a surface level, were political in nature as they sought to assist victims of war through a class lens, specifically those affected by capitalism. Like most left-leaning factions during the Spanish Civil War, the SRI used dehumanizing imagery to represent the fascist presence in the country. Here we see a grotesquely large and menacing hand reaching like a specter of doom to destroy the children of Spain. This appeal to pathos and the representation of nationalist Franco elements as soulless appendages of destruction is a recurring theme in leftist propaganda. La Confederación Nacional del Trabajo, or the CNT, was comprised of anarcho-syndicist labor unions whose primary goals consisted of aiding the working class seeking to achieve autonomy from the servitude of capitalism. They often worked with La Federación Anarquista Ibérica, or the FAI, which was a collective of militant anarchists with similar goals in mind concerning the liberation of the working class. While the CNT and FAI were not working on behalf of the communist government like the SRI, there are common themes that emerge between the propaganda of anarchist groups like the CNT and the FAI and communists. Here we see the recurring soulless gigantism of the nationalist presence, a gas mask contorts a soldier into a strange beast, an opposition emerges between the clenched fist of fascism and the open hand of anarchism, blue and white clash against black and yellow, colors of death. Uneasy alliances were made between communist and socialist groups working alongside anarchist organizations. Their shared common goal, conserve the Second Republic. It is worth noting that many of these groups were not affiliated with the Republican government until acts of nationalist aggression united them all under the banner of anti-fascism. While a lot of the propaganda from anarchist factions like the CNT used pathos, there is also a recurring theme of brotherhood and camaraderie that exists within anarchist artwork. This postcard represents the everyman quality of the anarchist movement. We see working class soldiers in earth tone colors. In large red letters, we see España Libre. While the soldiers are dressed the same, we still see their individual faces and style. This represents a libre not offered by fascism. El Partido Socialista Unificado de Catalunya, or the PSU, was the uneasy counterpart to the Communist International and its Spanish division, the Communist Party of Spain. Vehemently anti-fascist, the PSU uneasily worked alongside other Republican factions in the hopes of putting an end to nationalist aggression and revolt. 
Postcards like these were a common form of propaganda during the Spanish Civil War. While these postcards were distributed through mail and in stores, they could also be dropped from planes and airdrops in an attempt to reach as wide an audience as possible. Here we see a collection of PSU-affiliated postcards written in Catalan which would have been distributed all throughout Barcelona and Greater Catalonia. As a general with the Spanish military during the rebellious uprising against Republican rule, Francisco Franco rose through the ranks of power with ruthless efficiency. Wielding powers both militaristic and political, he was known as Calvillo for a seemingly all-encompassing stranglehold on power, the very definition of a dictator. Propaganda distributed by Franco and the Spanish nationalists were often quite visually distinct from that of the anarchists and communists. As opposed to the leftist focus on the collective, nationalist propaganda often represents Franco as a strongman, the singular liberator of Spain. The images are often ultra-realistic, non-artistic, graphic, violent, and stark. In this image, we see the strong character of Franco juxtaposed next to the supposed atrocities committed by the communist government. Keeping in the spirit of portraying the humanity of war, Republican propaganda often went beyond portraying the assimilated masses in their struggles against fascistic violence. By relying on popular figureheads affiliated with the various factions fighting under one banner, Republican propaganda emphasized the importance of collective leadership representative of the masses rather than one all-powerful leader. Here's one example of the humanist portrayal of a Republican-affiliated personality counter to the brutal aesthetics of the nationalists. This magazine cover portrays Felipe Arconada, founder of the JSU, a socialist youth organization. Here we see a diametrically opposed image to that of the Francoist strongman. Rather than the ultra-realism preferred by Franco and the nationalists, this pencil-drawn portrait continues socialist themes of working-class ethos. We see Arconada drawn as a leader of men, not a strong man, looking over a squadron of socialist youth. Communism was a primary target for the increasingly victorious fascists of Europe. While the threat of violent death by nationalists was a constant theme within their own propaganda efforts, ideology itself became a death knell. Here's a potent example of just that. In further examining the artistic propensities of the fascistic propaganda machine, their use of symbolic imagery has a cruder effect than most left-wing propaganda. Here we see a poster from the former equating socialism with death. Rather than using the deep symbolic imagery or humanism seen in anarchist or communist work, this piece illustrates the crude transformation of a hammer and sickle into a skull. This piece is unique, however, for its lack of focus on Franco. In focusing on the ideological motivations at the heart of the Spanish Civil War, propaganda such as this poster ignores the human presence affected by war and instead emphasizes the human-made inventions used as justification for death and destruction on a massive scale. By 1938, Republican hopes for victory were beginning to dwindle. As the Second World War loomed on the horizon and barbaric atrocities were becoming commonplace across Europe, all of the perceptible evils of the world's political systems and ideologies were open targets for culpability. Even tenuous associations between nations became symbolic statements with the potential to linger on in public conscience long after conflict subsided and new political affiliations were formed. This piece, published by an unknown pro-communist artist, represents the four heads of capitalism, military, politics, business, and state-sanctioned religion. This piece is notable for its allusion to the Nazi regime. We see a man crucified on a swastika, beheaded by a monster wearing a Kaiser helmet. Because this is late in the war effort, the association between Franco and his German allies comes through strongly here. The message is loud and clear. The nationalist ideology is one of bloodlust, and its associations with the institutionalized evils of the world will lead to nothing but death and misery. Short-lived and overwhelming in the sadism and total destruction wrought by both sides of the conflict, by 1939 the Spanish Civil War was over and Franco's rebellious agitators were the ultimate victors. 
This triumph coincided with Hitler's blitz on his European neighbors. These were dark and uncertain times indeed. With victory in hand, the propaganda in Francoist Spain took on the manufactured air of pleasantness. For example, this postcard represents the day Hitler and Franco met in France in 1940 at Hendé. While eerie in its own right, due to the benevolent portrayal of two men who were responsible for innumerable deaths, this postcard was created as a memento to the close relationship between Nazi Germany and fascist Spain. It is likely that without Hitler's support, Franco may have not won the war. This piece is one of many postcards distributed throughout post-war Spain showing Franco in a favorable light. The nationalist victory was total defeat against all opposition. Franco outlived Europe's failed fascist governments and stayed in power until 1975, until he died at the age of 82. His brutal methodology softened over the decades, and it was during his tenure that Spain underwent profound economic growth. It is because of these factors that his legacy is a complicated one. However, the propaganda and video footage from the late 1930s will remind future generations of the barbarism employed in the acquisition of power, even when Franco was portrayed as a relatable strongman who alone could save Spain from the perceived evils of socialism. Even after the war, Franco's government continued to distribute postcards, such as this one, and other forms of propaganda. Holding both the Spanish flag and the flag of Fe Jones, the fascist organization to which Franco belonged prior to overthrowing the Spanish government. Fed Johns later became known as the Movimiento Nacional, or the National Movement, the only political party allowed in Spain until its transition to democracy in the 1970s. And as with the previous example, overt violence has been omitted, and in its place is color and the image of a society in the good hands of a benevolent strongman. War ephemera continues to remind future generations of how ideology is weaponized. Superseding it, the art that exists in reference to the war continues to affect the world around it. As a reminder of the violence, we can look to Federico Garcia Lorca's execution by Franco's militia. In George Orwell and Ernest Hemingway's accounts, the realities of the war are laid bare. Even distant expressions of the pain felt by the losing side, such as the music of Rolando Alacron from decades later, indicate a longevity that ephemeral pleas on fading paper could never hope to achieve. Men who never fought before, who were not trained in arms, who only wanted work and food, fight on. Thank you very much, Kenneth Yates and Melissa. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Our next group, consisting of Alyssa Juman, Eleanor McKinley, and Tiffany O'Harris, constructed an entire museum exhibition space in virtual reality. Their gallery uses a variety of images from the Wolfsonian's collections to demonstrate how society has used art and literature propagandistically to marginalize groups of people and also how those people have used their own art and literature in turn to combat that othering. They will now give us a guided tour. Okay, I'll begin. Hello, I'm Melissa Juman. And I'm Tiffany Harris. And I'm Eleanor McKinley. Uh, we've created a virtual museum for you that will take a look at the literature and art of the modernist era that promoted hate and marginalization of people based on their race, gender, and sexuality. These pieces and their subsequent epigraphs focus on how these marginalization practices can lead to the self-annihilation of our society should we continue down this path. What we're presenting today is a guided tour of the museum narrated by Eleanor. For the sake of time, we will not present everything on the display, but you are more than welcome to return and explore the museum at your own pace through artsteps.com. Our museum does have VR capabilities should you wish to fully immerse yourself. Depending on your virtual reality device, you can either log into ArtSteps or download the ArtSteps app on your phone. We hope you enjoy. Thank you. Throughout history, society has marginalized people through categorization, creating a civilization that is overrun with perceived stereotypes. 
In the following exhibition, we will look at art and literature that perpetuates the categorization of others to society's inevitable final outcome of self-annihilation. This wing presents the ever-present aggression towards black members of society. This interactive wing displays multiple expressions of black hate and propaganda. The nine pieces below are the images depicting the events of Scottsboro, Alabama, before, during, and after the wrongful rape accusation of nine black young men, Charlie Weems, Ozzy Powell, Clarence Norris, Olin Montgomery, Willie Robinson, Haywood Patterson, Andy, and Roy Wright. Aurelio Bertaglia, a fascist Italian artist, was employed by Benito Mussolini in World War II and used his art to curry favor for Mussolini in the minds of the Italian people. Bertiglia's fascist ideals were widely accepted across Italy and used to convince the public that Italy was not invading Ethiopia, rather they were liberating Ethiopians. Bertiglia's postcards knowingly used techniques to impress upon Italian people that Ethiopians were infantile and unable to care for themselves. They were made to look like Ethiopians were actually grateful for their Italian savior. The poster in the upper right hand corner translates into People of Tigre, boys listen. You know that wherever the Italian flag is raised, there is freedom. Therefore, in your country, slavery under any form is abolished. La Defensia de la Raza, or the Defense of the Breed, was a bi-weekly Italian magazine published from 1938 to 1943, used as the main anti-Semitic propaganda vehicle during the years of its printing. The people placed on the cover of this magazine were typically deemed as biologically and culturally inferior. The magazine was typically divided into four sections, science, documentation, controversy, and questionnaire. Next to the orange cover, you will find a page from this publication. We are now entering the gender and sexuality wing of the museum, featuring the poetry of County Cullen and the feminist work Why Women Cry by Elizabeth Hawk. Gender is defined as a social construct used to classify a person as a man, woman, or some other identity fundamentally different from the sex one is assigned at birth. And sexuality is defined as the components of a person that include their biological sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and sexual practices. Considered to be one of the most representative voices of the Harlem Renaissance, Cullen is an intersection of black ideas and yearnings as well as white influence. He came to believe that art transcends race and that it can be used as a vehicle to minimize the distance between black and white people. Cullen's poem, Tableau for Donald Duff, at first glance is a poem that speaks of a biracial friendship. It should be noted that Donald Duff is in fact Cullen's white lover and this poem was written after Duff's death. So rather than looking at this poem as a commentary on friendship, it should be looked at as a commentary on interracial romantic homosexual relationships. The following is an excerpt from the book. This book is for those women and for all the men who are thinking about marrying or are married to such women. Maybe the book is even a little more for those men than for the women. 
because a great many men have never thought about these homely matters. And if they don't start think thinking soon, they may very well be overtaken by a major revolt on the part of their wives and prospective wives. A lot of men have already found their homes being run a little unsatisfactorily. They have found their wives a trifle glum and their children a bit quarrelsome. But how would the men like to find themselves without any homes or wives or children at all? The back cover of Why Women Cry is covered with bowls that are similar in shape to a female uterus, bringing our attention to the stereotype of the masculine female that is ever present in the conversation of women's equality. The billboards in the open air art park are sections from John Thompson's poem, City of Dreadful Night, said to be a symbolic vision of the city as a condition of human life. The poetic city becomes the personification of life and death, a place marred by the loss of purpose and hope. As you roam through these billboards, we ask that you please take into consideration what each stanza is saying, as well as the art and circumstances surrounding the art presented in each wing of the museum. The final billboard is a cautionary representation of society should we continue down the path of hierarchical categorization and the marginalization of people. And as she came more near, my soul grew mad with fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was. And I came through the desert. Hell is mild. They are the most powerful, yet insane. And outward madness, not to be controlled. A perfect reason in the central brain which has no power, but sitteth wan and cold. And I alive feel turning in stone, and beautiful where death to end my grief, most hateful to destroy the sight of thee. Dear vision, better than all death or life, but I renounce all choice of life or death for either shall be ever at their side, thus in bliss or woe will ever well. Arriving at the final billboard, we leave you to reflect on this poem and painting coupling. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today, and we hope you have enjoyed the exhibition as we have enjoyed sharing our experience with you. Thank you very much, Alyssa, Eleanor, Tiffany. Our fourth group returns us to the blog format. Genesis Pabon, Lindsay Schatzberg, and Sophia Tirado explored 1920s reprints of several works by Oscar Wilde, illustrated by an artist known as Alistair. As most people know, Wilde died in disgrace after serving a prison term for sodomy and gross indecency. As this group shows, later avant-garde figures like Alistair helped to rehabilitate Wilde's reputation during the modernist era, in part by enhancing his status as a gay icon. Genesis, Lindsay, and Sophia, it's your turn. Uh, Sophia, I don't think your volume is working. 
Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, it's just that my headphones have their own mute button and it's really easy to turn that thing on and off. We're fine now. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, so this is our blog. And as Dr. Cato was saying, we uh, the focus of this blog is to provide um, an analysis of Alistair's artwork um, in the additions he did of um, Wilde's um, Wild's work specifically, um, his um, The Sphinx Salome and The Birthday of the Infanta. Um, Alastair worked in the decadent era, which is about the 1920s in that decade. Um, and since he worked in the decadent era, that era was known for a lot of like, it's, it reminds me a bit of the Rococo era where um, it was a lot of emphasis in intricate details and um, like the opposite of minimalism. Um, working uh, with a lot of little, just as many details as possible in a piece. And so, for example, uh, we have this piece, uh, which is the cover of the blog that we chose. And you can see that um, this is this is from the birthday of the Infanta. And this dress is, is, not only is the dress itself incredibly detailed, but the line work is because it seems to be painted with little dots, which must have taken um, who knows amount of, who knows how long, but that was the style of the decadent movement, which Alistair was working on. Um, so to begin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to my blog post. I wrote the blog post about Salome. Um, so in this blog post, I, give a little summary of Salome. And Salome is a play, it's a tragedy, and it recounts the events. It's it's fictionalized, right? But the but the character Salome, who is the daughter of Queen Herodias and King Herod, those are um, biblical characters. So they existed before Oscar Wilde wrote the play. And basically in the play, what happens is that Salome comes, um, um, King Herod is having a party and Salome wanders onto the terrace of the palace while the party is going on and hears the voice of Jokanan, which is John the Baptist. She demands to see him. And when the soldiers bring him out because he's being held captive in a cistern, when the soldiers bring him out, he, she immediately becomes um, infatuated with him um however um Jokanan is returned to the cistern and king herod comes out and becomes then becomes enraptured with salome like salome has become enraptured with Jokanan, and asks her to dance for him and salome does so on the condition that she um King Herod will do anything for her. And so she does this dance, which is famously known as the Dance of the Seven Veils. And after she performs this dance, she asks for Jokanan's head. So they behead Jokanan and she kisses the head. And so then after that, King Herod declares her a monster and has Salome killed. That's the entire play. Um, so Salome is kind of, one of the major themes of Salome is obviously um, lust and sex, right? Or at least more, more so lust. And so the drawings which Alistair had um, illustrated in the 1922 edition of Salome are very flowing. They use the color pink, which in that era didn't really mean so much um, a femininity and innocence, but more so um, seduction, which is why the color pink was probably used. So here we have Salome and the Syrian, who is a character 
that is in love with Salome and is one of the soldiers. So he's the one that brings Jokanan in and out of his cell. And because he's in love with Salome, he um, does what she wants, which is to bring Jokanan out of the cistern. Uh, so here we have him. Um, he's smiling and Salome is kind of like all over him. And the second one is Salome and presumably Joe Cannon, who you can see the way that Salome is drawn and the things that she's wearing, which is this looks to be floral um, draped dress and has her topless, whereas Joe Cannon is super unflattering, modest, completely black robe. And you can see the contrast between those two characters and therefore like what their goals are in the story. And here's, here's probably the most famous illustration. This is the one that's also reproduced on the title page. And this is Salome dancing, or at least holding up Joe Cannon's head after she asked for it, after she does the dance of the seven veils. Her eyes are covered and the blood is rendered in pink as well. There's pink and black are the only colors used in these illustrations. Um, and Salome is kind of, she's not, she's not topless anymore. And it's more, the sense of lust is kind of gone and replaced with uh, a, a sense of um, monst not monstrosity, but there is no longer, Salome is no longer an object to be lusted over, or she's no longer desirable, which is likely why she's maybe wearing pants and her face is half covered up. Um, and then the last illustration is Salome cradling Joe Cannon's head as the soldiers um, go at, surround her and in order to kill her on the orders of King Herod. And they're silhouetted and they have eyes on their shields, which I thought was pretty interesting. I thought that it might symbolize judgment or judgment and therefore rejection on behalf of the society that Salome lives in. Because um, King Herod, even though he asked her to do this um, super salacious um, dance. Um, once Salome shows any um, agency of her own um, in regards to love, um, he is disgusted by this and has her killed. So that's my blog post. I'm going to pass it over to Lindsay, my colleague Lindsay, to um, uh, talk about her own blog post. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for everyone who is watching right now. Um, yeah, thank you all for being here. So my blog post is on the Sphinx. I guess, Sophia, if you could just... Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and it's a poem by Oscar Wilde. And it's basically, it revolves around a man who questions a being known as a Sphinx and about her sexual endeavors. So like her sexual encounters with mythological creatures such as uh, beasts, humans, gods, and much more. And he, he mentions a lover of hers called Amon and he's very detailed in, about their liaison. And he, reveals that Amon is, right, um, the Sphinx is, um, she believes that Amon has passed on, but the narrator believe, uh, reveals that Amon is not dead by the end of the poem, and neither are any of her past lovers, which she also believes <laughs> were all dead. Um, Basically, at the end of the, the poem, the narrator is disgusted with her and himself 
and he vows to be left alone with his crucifix, uh, which represents Christ. Um, and it just, I don't know, it changes the, but at the beginning of the poem, he was very much enamored with her, but by the end, he seemed to change his tune and he was just, he was so disgusted with her uh, demeanor. And that's pretty much how the poem ends. I know it's, it's kind of gloomy, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I guess we'll scroll down to the first image I have there. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, we have to begin wrapping up soon, so I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly. Um, this first image is a, uh, an image of the Sphinx, and its uh, teal is a very prominent color in Alistair's illustrations of, of all of his work in the Sphinx. Um, it's, it's used, basically, it's like, I view it as, it's almost like, um, represents water in a way, um, because she's kind of like this mythological creature and she has a tail. And in a, a, another image, I guess you can just scroll past this one um, to the second image, this image right here. Uh, she looks like a mermaid. So it's just, it's very fitting that teal would be a prominent color in his designs. Um, they're very sexual illustrations because um, the Sphinx is depicted as a very sexual character. And Alistair's uh, background in dance really uh, applies here because you know you can see it's almost it almost appears as if she's dancing. You know she's got her her arm you know extended and her tail is flipping back and. It just, it looks like a, a dance in a way to me. Um, I guess you could scroll down uh, again, Sophia, thank you. Um, to the last picture. Uh, this photo, this illustration, I'm sorry, I find to be the most um, telling by far because it shows like the extravagant lifestyle that the Sphinx lived and it's important to note this because uh, it's written that she is also very active at night, which is what the, the moon represents. And you can see the candles and the tapestries and she's laying in the bed. She has her breasts exposed. Um, it's just, all, it's all very sexual in nature. And I think that's what Alistair was trying to go for when he was um, illustrating for Wilde's poem. And um, yeah, I guess that's, that's pretty much all I have to say about this poem. Um, I guess I will pass it on to my colleague Genesis and uh, her blog posts. So Genesis, if you will take it away. Genesis, are you, do you want to say a few words maybe to wrap up? Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, um, so okay. can you scroll a little bit down? Okay. To the image. So the birthday of the, yeah, please. Okay, so that one is the burning stakes and it's the one image that he has that is um, fire and has the color red. Um, so for this one, Alistair um, really illustrated Oscar Wilde and it has to do with the aesthetic and the decadent movement. This one is more of reflective of the aesthetic movement because that one um, is not so much about telling a political or moral message. Um, you can go to the next picture, please. The next illustration. 
Okay, so this one, um, Alistair himself was a dancer and this is re reflective of the experiences he had with that. Um, this one has a little less color in it. It's a little different from the last one. Um, and it's just, you know, can you go to the next one as well, please? Okay. And then the last in illustration is of the Infanta herself, who is the princess of the story. Um, and underneath her is the dwarf of the story. And it shows, you know, their class difference. She's higher up, he's lower down. Um, and it's reflective of the decadent movement, which is more focused on luxury, showing wealth, um, showing your status off, which is what she's doing. She's literally above him. Um, and Oscar Wilde, you know, his impact is great. He went from, you know, being a criminal because of his sexuality to becoming a gay icon. And this is reflective of how Alistair decided to illustrate his um, works years later after his death because of its impact and its ability to pave the way for modernism. And that's, that's um, about it for my blog. Thank you very much. Sophia Genesis, Lindsay, appreciate it. Uh, we close out tonight's presentations with another video. This time, Arlette Aguiar, Natalie Enriquez, and Liana Rodriguez use the video to show the influence of German expressionism on American literary, artistic, and popular culture during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. They'll trace the impact of the famous German expressionistic film, The Gollum, on, two, on work of two leftist American artists, Abe Loschko and Lynn Ward, as well as on the 1931 American film adaptation, Frankenstein. Hello. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Natalie and my group members are Liana and Arlette. Our group project for this course intends to analyze gothic slash horror illustrations from one of Mary Shelley's various re reprintings of Frankenstein, illustrated by Lind Ward and Abe Blaschko's illustrations from The Golem. We will be comparing these illustrations with their film, film adaptations and our analysis focuses on comparing the artistic style, theme, their modernist depiction and the way the characters are represented. We hope you enjoy the video and that we have prepared for you all. Thank you. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Modernist Materialist Project fulfilled for Florida International University and Dr. Nathaniel Cadle. Today we'll be discussing the effect of one modernist movement, expressionism, on one popular fictional genre, horror. Why horror, you might ask? Truthfully, we chose horror because modernism is so often associated with the high arts. However, modernism influenced more than just the literary fiction and high arts. Modernism also influenced genre fiction and events. Horror, as an example, is simply one of the most obvious in its modernist influences. We narrowed down our discussion to one movement, Expressionism, because of its distinct presence in the films and artwork of the early 20th century. Expressionism is notoriously hard to define, much like the term modernism is hard to define. For the sake of argument, this is the definition we've created. An artistic movement popular in the very early 20th century, especially after the First World War, where the artist or creator is less concerned with physical realism than in expressing the emotional, mental, and psychological realities of their subjects. Thanks to this movement's influence on the early cinema of the period, our discussion of modernism's influence on the horror genre will mainly touch on expressionism. We will see how the dark events of the time period such as World War I, the Depression, the trials of Weimar Germany, and the trauma and destitution of the ordinary person all play a role into these expressionist influences on horror. As we delve into the artwork and films, we will continue to define terms as they come up. For now, let's get started into our overview with our first figure of interest, Abe Blaschko. Abe Blaschko was a Jewish-American political artist who lived for most of the 20th century up until 2011. His work was featured in a variety of leftist publications like The New Masses and The People's World. The work you see here in the video is titled The Golem. In Jewish folklore, a golem is an artificial man created by a rabbi through the use of a name and a sacred word. This ritual would put the golem under the rabbi's control. In its most famous folktale from Prague, the golem was indistinguishable from other humans once it came to life and would defend the Jewish ghetto from the wrath of anti-Semites. 
This makes Blaschko's painting interesting. As we see, the golden figure is a hulking mass of a man, almost as much a part of the architecture as the buildings in the background. A stormy expression of displeasure overtakes its massive face as it stares down at Nazis violently beating Jewish people in the streets. Notice the overwhelming Gothic atmosphere in the piece. We're left in a monochromatic world. Most of the figures in the piece have no faces. Have no faces. The only human-like expression we get from the art is from the golem, who is obviously not pleased. The piece's sense of scale and reality are warped from what we find in reality, but these artistic choices are perfect for conveying the tragedy and terror of this real-life event in late 1930s Nazi Germany. Compare this to a later, more cartoonish return of Blaschko's golem. Here we have no background, and the piece is in full color. The golem still, still appears as a massive figure compared to the Nazis in its grasp. But the Nazis are also portrayed as hissing, bulbous figures with fangs. Blaschko's audience would immediately associate this with a political cartoon in a newspaper. Compared to the somber and serious painting from before, we can clearly see the differences in Blaschko's influences. One piece is a satirization, while the other piece uses both Gothic and Expressionist influences to depict a tragedy. For a brief moment, I want to touch on a point I lightly skipped. In folklore, a golem is meant to look just like a human person. Why is it, then, that Blaschko's golem is so obviously artificial compared to other subjects, despite the human gravitas in its face? Here we turn to Blaschko's likely influence and an important foundational text in horror cinema, The Golem, How He Came Into the World. Directed by Paul Wegener, who also stars as the titular Golem, this film is a prime example of German Expressionist cinema. To again define a term, German Expressionist cinema refers to a series of films influenced by the larger Expressionist movement. German Expressionist cinema became particularly popular from the early to mid-20s during the height of the post-war Weimar Republic. These films used chiaroscuro in lighting, distorted sets and architecture, rather extreme makeup choices, and dark plots to portray the emotions and social attitudes prevailing in a Weimar Germany still reeling from the consequences of the First World War. Paul Wegener's The Golem in particular focuses on the anti-Semitism of the time period that would, of course, go on to help bolster the Nazi party in the 1930s. The plot focuses on Rabbi Loew, a leader of the Jewish community in 1600s Prague, who creates this golem to avoid the prophesied destruction of their community. The film's themes very much rest in the story's Jewishness, even if the film is somewhat ambiguous on their status. The Jewish characters are portrayed as victims of state violence, bigotry, corruption, and a later out-of-control golem. At various points in the film, we see these Jewish characters wearing special symbols on their clothing to denote their status as Jews, predicting the later integration of the Star of David patches during Nazi Germany. We see the ruling class literally laugh at their suffering, while others bribe officials. At the same time, the Jewish characters, Rabbi Loev in particular, are shown to be wielders of magic and sorcery, contacting a demon to bring the golem to life. The golem uses the principles of German Expressionist cinema to highlight the experiences and emotions of its characters. In this scene, for example, where two Jewish elders beg a young knight to send a message to the emperor and plead for their homes, these impractical daggers protruding from the roof highlight the threat that they are facing. The camera and editing do their best to highlight the brightest lights and darkest shadows to reflect the psyche of the characters. Here, for example, we see Rabbi Love's shadow looking upon his creation. It immediately tells the audience all they need to know and feel about this scene more than any foreshadowing or exposition could. These same principles apply to the character of the golem himself. Notice again that unlike folklore, the makeup makes it very clear that our golem is not human but a creature of reanimated clay. The geometric shapes of his clay hair, along with simple peasant's clothing, represent a simplicity of self not present in other characters. Consider also how the performance of the golem reflects its artificial nature. Paul Wegener walks and moves like a mechanical man, giving a performance that would go to inspire other artificial monsters on the silver screen. While it may seem trite now, this performance hinges on his expressionist vision that again highlights the spiritual and emotional nature of the monster, rather than how he would move in real life. 
Overall, the golem is one of the best examples of the German Expressionist cinema. It was an influence for many future horror greats, and in its stills and clips, you can see how many directors and creators to come will take its lessons on craft to create the modern horror genre. One of the most well-known Expressionist illustrators was Lind Ward, an American artist and novelist whose, whose wood engravings we will continuously ref reference for their use of light and darkness, as well as the display of emotional, mental, and physical conditions of the depicted subjects. James Whale's 1931 Frankenstein is based on Mary Shelley's gothic novel from 1818. This film incorporates gothic elements such as death, mystery, and the supernatural. One of the most prominent features of a gothic composition is the sinister setting. This film starts off with a man in a graveyard shoveling dirt on someone's grave. This grim beginning is the perfect example of a sinister setting because graveyards are often associated with death. This opening scene could be a foreshadowing of all the death which happens later on during the film. Um, the illustrations of the original Fra Frankenstein by Mary Shelley were illustrated by Lind Ward. Many of these illustrations inspired certain scenes in the 1931 film version. The first scene I would like to, talk to discuss is when the monster attacks his creator and starts to choke him. So this scene reminded me a lot of one of Lind Ward's illustrations where the monster is choking Dr. Frankenstein's son and kills him. In another part of the film, the monster throws a little girl into a pond without realizing that he could drown her in this way. Before this happens, the monster was playing with the little girl and throwing flowers onto the water and they would float, so it seems he assumed that the girl would float too if he threw her in the water. Um, when he sees his reflection in the water after doing this, he, re he realizes what he has done, he, uh, starts to panic and runs away from the crime scene. Uh, he accidentally murdered his, the first friend he made. This scene where he looks at the water after murdering the little girl is similar to one of Lind Ward's illustrations where the monster is looking at the, his reflection in the water. In another scene of the film, Elizabeth gets attacked and murdered by the monster, and her dead body is seen spread out on the, her bed. One of Lind Ward's illustrations shows Elib Elizabeth's body laid out on the bed in the same way. And finally, another scene which shares similarities with Ward's illustrations is the one where the monster is being chased into a windmill by the villagers who are carrying lit torches. This can be compared to the illustration where the villagers are chasing down the monster. All of these sim similarities between the 1931 Frankenstein film and the original novel illustrations depicts how old literature greatly influenced films in the future and it still continues to do so to this day. This film not only has gothic elements, but is also expressionistic in its style and setting. Expressionism is an artistic movement that is identified by the use of distorting and exaggerated angles, intense color, and a sense of doom. All of these features can be seen in the Frankenstein film, the contrast of colors and shadows can be seen throughout the film, and the fact that it's in black and white accentuates accentuates the contrast between colors and shadows, making the only difference between them be light versus dark versions of black, gray, and white. The monster is dressed in all black and spends mo most of the time in the dark. The innocent and good characters in the film, such as Elizabeth um, and the little girl, are depicted wearing white or light colors. <clears throat> this contrast between dark and light is a repre representation of good versus evil. Light represents all that is good or innocent, and darkness represents everything that is evil. The distortion of certain settings in the film, like buildings and Dr. Frankenstein's lab, enhances how creepy or scary a scene can be perceived as. Distortion can also be seen in the character of the monster itself, for example, his unusually large size, his out-of-proportion forehead, and the flat angles of his skull make his character look distorted and unusual. Exp expressionism in, su in films such as Frankenstein are characterized by set designs with non-realistic and weird angles. They also use dramatic lighting and camera angles to emphasize some particular affect like fear or horror. Another aspect of expressionism which is seen in the film is the looming sense of doom. This foreshadowing of an impending doom is created by gothic nature elements such as darkness, thunder, rain, and lightning. In the part of the film where Dr. Frankenstein is reviving his monster for the first time, there is a huge thunderstorm. 
This terrible weather is a sign that something bad is going to happen and invokes fear into the audience. An additional illustration by Ward that is similar to the film is this in which the monster is revealed. It highlights the exaggerated features Ward associates with this tragic creature. The height of the monster being just as tall as his creator's bed and his parting of the bed curtains reveal Ward's intention to display the monster as one decrepit entity. As the pieces that make up the monster are a product of grey robberies, one can see in the hands, torso, and legs the protrusion of bones. His face is similarly depicted as skull-like, giving the illusion of uncommon death. From the moment of his birth, the monster is already tinged with darkness and is something to fear. His larger-than-life stature is difficult to ignore and likewise to come to terms with. The illustration highlights the illusion of grandeur and power as encapsulated in a semi-decayed body. Therefore, it juxtaposes the joy and pride of birth and creation to the anguish and hopelessness of death. Many of Ward's illustrations of the monster fail to clearly define his facial features, and this image is no different. We see the posterior of the monster's body, and again his full height in comparison to his creator. Here Dr. Frankenstein makes gestures to get the monster to leave and abandon him. The somewhat muscular physique is merely a facade for a being that was intended to be an ideal strong and masculine figure. By not focusing on his facial features, the monster's humanity is negated and therefore harder to recognize. Outside of his Frankenstein illustrations, Lynn Ward produced six wood engraved novels. This German woodcutting tradition that Ward is commonly known for can be defined as a distortion of the world around a subject in order to focus on the human experiences and the consequent emotions. The typical woodcutting contained bold uses of black and white space as well as exaggerated features. It was intended to elicit an emotional response from the reader in which one comes to terms with darker humanistic themes. One such illustration is this one of a protagonist fleeing his debtors in Ward's novel, God's Man, 1929. This image in particular demonstrates the protagonist in the middle of escaping from the debtors that hold him back. The man is displayed in comparison to the large, solemn buildings in the background. Ward's focus is clearly the emotions of this man as he escapes society and intends to free himself from societal pressures and expectations, as well as to those whom he gave his soul to. This illustration is reminiscent of his depiction of Frankenstein's monster fleeing the angry mob. Both subjects are at the forefront of the image and are illustrated as larger than the other human subjects. Although not as hidden as the monster, we are unable to get a clear look at the protagonist's features, but we can assume that both images elicit fear, deception, and a sense of the other. This other image from Lynn Ward's woodcut novel, Mad Man's Drum, illustrates more of the expressionist details that denote the features of the wicked slave trader. The background of the illustration is purposely obscured and therefore the central focus is on the dark-rimmed eyes and malicious smile of the protagonist. His expressions satisfy the illusion of the evilness of his occupation and thus alienation of his character. He stands alone and it would seem that the other characters revolve around him. The way he clutches the stolen drum also reinforces the belief that this character is an egoist. As mentioned previously, our focus was to tie these two films and various illustrations to the expressionist movement of the early 20th century. Each image and clip lends itself to the analysis of the dark experiences of the human condition. The Golem and Frankenstein depictions are both prime examples of artists and authors who wish to mimic human experiences through a non-human creature. The illustrations present the frequently disfigured features like the faces and bodies of both the golem and Frankenstein's monster. Larger-than-life creatures that are seen as similar to humans but can never fit in as their surroundings are plagued with tragedy. The directors and illustrators mentioned are experts in using light and dark visuals that have been a driving influence of horror as a genre in film, art, and literature. Thank you very much, Arlette, Natalie, Deanna. We have time for about 10 minutes of question and answer. I have actually responded to a couple of uh, comments and questions about the links. I uh, cut, copied and pasted the chat, so you should be able to access them there. Um, but are there any questions? You can use the Q&A function. So uh, I also have the chat box open. So please feel free to, to use either. 
I know that John Mogul has a question, so I may call on him. Maybe I'll, I'll jump in. Um, and I just first want to congratulate all of the students on those presentations and on the work you've done, uh, both you know the, the analysis and the interpretation that you offered of these works was really interesting. Um, and I, I really learned a great deal from it, but also on the quality of your projects and the way that you sort of mastered these platforms. And I'm just curious if any of you have given thought to, you know, what your next film or your next blog or your next virtual exhibition might be now that you, I, I don't want to assume that, that none of you ever used these platforms before, but, um, you know, now that you have some um, facility with them, whether uh, they, you know, you can think of new directions that you can take, especially because it seems like you can accomplish things, um, you know, with these media that you can't necessarily accomplish with like a term paper. Um, and I guess I, the same question could apply to uh, Dr. Cato in your teaching, whether you um, intend to continue down this path or you're gonna go back to your term papers. As, as you can see from Leanna's uh, response in the chat, uh, so, several of them still have theses to write. Um, so I think that's probably going to be a, a major focus for many of them. Um, as I said at the very beginning, this is uh, a course that I developed as a faculty fellow um, with the WPHL, so that the public humanities is very much a part of that, that effort. So I can certainly envision myself teaching this course or a version of this course for some time to come. I, I have a good relationship with the Wolfsonian. And I would also just point out something that I didn't mention at the beginning. The students were largely working from digital versions. Um, digitized versions rather than the, the actual physical materials because we're still in the pandemic. Um, and so the next time around, it would certainly be great to actually have the students in the physical spaces there at the Wolfsonian. But do any of the other, um, do any of the students want to comment on whether or not they're going to maintain a blog or continue releasing YouTube videos or become influencers? Um, I can comment on that just from the the VR perspective. Um, I'm I'm a high school English teacher, and so um, I have used virtual reality and augmented reality in my classroom before. But things that had already been pre-created. So through this project, I was able to to learn the ins and outs a little bit more, and um, creating my own space that my students will definitely be using in the the near future. So. I'm excited. I don't know if they will be, but it might be cool. <laughs> my impression is that the, and, and of course my students can correct me if, if I'm wrong, um, but my impression is that they responded very well to this and seem to enjoy it. Um, the collaborative aspect, of course, is also present. They were working collaboratively in teams. Um, I don't know whether that actually made it easier for them or, or harder in terms of just scheduling time. Um, it's, I think probably it's more, so some people enjoy it more than others. Collaboration is yeah. always harder than working individually. <laughs> there was a question from Marjorie Gordon um, that Leanna already res responded to about uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. So Marjorie, I hope you can see that there. Um, Yates, did you want to jump in? I thought I saw you pop up. I just wanted to mention that, yes, the extra challenge of having to do it remotely was an exciting challenge to try to overcome. And I think we we all rose to the occasion, everybody in the class. So I haven't seen anybody else's work and I enjoyed it all very much. And I think Marjorie has asked a follow-up question that uh, that is actually a very good question. I mean, all the questions she's asked have been good, but this one I think is a really good question to maybe um, start throwing out to the entire the entire class. Were any of you inspired to research tangential subjects further in future projects? So, is there anything here that um, 
that you've worked on that you'd like to um, pursue? I mean, is anyone working on anything that's sort of tangentially related to the theses that you're going to be writing? I can answer that a little bit. Um, um, my group, we did the, the VR museum and we did, we spoke a lot about marginalization um, and alterity. And specifically, um, and I know I am um, specifically working on this in, to some extent in my thesis. Um, uh, it, it does have a bit of race, gender, sexuality to it, but it, my, my thesis is focused more on how you create monsters through um, societal, like societies create monsters through the implication of these um, forms of alterity. I'll also just make an observation about the, the very first group that spoke, the one about the pulp magazines, and they can comment if they want. Uh, if you read through there, um, a couple of them tried to adopt the tone and style of, of pulp writers themselves, I think a little bit. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Natalie's entry, if she wants to say anything about that. Um, yeah, so my group come from the MFA program in creative writing. So I think um, whenever we write um, in any other genre, like academic texts or commercial texts, in this case, it's a blog for a public audience. Um, I guess we just come from that angle where we try to spice things up a little bit. So yeah, I just did try to use a bit of the um, sensationalist tone of the pulp mags. It's fun to read. We probably have time for one more question. I think we're going to lose our Zoom license in just a few minutes. Um, so I just want to, um, again, thank all of the participants um, for the really lively, interesting, and impressive presentations, and also thank um, all the attendees for joining us this evening um, and getting a chance to witness uh, the really great work that is going on um, at FIU and at the Wolfsonian. So thank you all very much. <laughs>